right, we're going to get started. Um, for those of you sitting all the way back up, if you want to come down, please feel free. Um, this is a breakout, so it's a more casual, intimate setting, even if we're still in this big room. Um, you will be able to ask questions throughout. Um, Joe Yunnan, who will moderate this session, um, will repeat your question, uh, because this is webcast, so that way everything is on the record. Um, as always, if you ask questions, it's good to keep them brief um, and not necessarily make a statement about them, but really go to the core of, um, of your question right away, so that the presenters also um, have the time um, allocated to their presentations. So um, you have met everyone who you're going to see on stage now. Uh, Joe Yonan from the Washington Post as our moderator, and Tal Ronan and Cheryl Berger, our chefs, who will be um, presenting this session on vegan cooking for the 21st century, a fresh approach, because what they're doing is really not your mama's vegetari uh, vegetarian or vegan cooking. Uh, so we're very excited about that. I'm going to uh, check out other sessions um, to make sure that everything else is uh, ongoing. So you are now in the very capable hands of Joe Yonan. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for returning from snack time. Um, and can I just say, wasn't that last session, wasn't the food just glorious looking? I just, I can't get over the brassica on brassica action that we got to see. Um, earlier today, so um, <laughs> um, so you got to see Chef uh, Tal Ronan also yesterday when he made that beautiful golden pasta, um, and he's got more to show us today. I've had the pleasure of eating at Crossroads, um, and if you haven't eaten there, I I can tell you you're you're absolutely missing out. So um, can't wait to see what Chef is has got for us today. Yeah. Hi. Slido. I think you can do whatever you'd like. It's a fairly informal um, setup, so feel free to, if you want to just raise your hand or call it out if I'm not looking out. Um, and, and as Ann said, I'll try to repeat things just so that the webcast folks can hear. Chef. Yes. Sorry. Trying to get the AV sorted out. Boy, I got nothing else, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I need a clicker, right? Oh, yeah. Here you go. Thanks. How oh, is everybody? <laughs> All right. Let's make sure that comes up. Cool. So uh, nice to see everyone. And i um, going to do a session on how to impart uh, flavors of the ocean into plant-based cooking. And um, I'm going to demo two dishes and also talk about a few dishes at the restaurant uh, that I can't demo, but hopefully uh, give you a little insight uh, into how we prepare them. Um, if you missed it yesterday, uh, I'm out of LA. I have a restaurant in West Hollywood, and um, and there six, seven days a week. So if you're in town, stop in. Um, okay, flavors of the ocean. So um, actually the first dish uh, that I'm going to demo has been on our menu for coming up on seven years now. It's our artichoke oysters. We can never take it off the menu. Um, and I'm going to be demoing that, so I'm going to skip speaking about it. <laughs> um, this is our smoked carrot lox. I know you guys have seen uh, probably a, a lot of people doing this now, but we Truly have been doing this uh, for a long, long time. It came out of uh, an accident. We were shooting something for the first cookbook and we were smoking carrots and um, was snacking on them. We had bagels brought in for the photo shoot and put it on there and it worked out great. So we take uh, large heirloom carrots and we smoke them over hickory and uh, to impart a little flavor of the ocean, we take uh, nori, toast it, and then buzz it in the uh, Vitamix or a coffee grinder. And we encrust the whole carrots with the nori. And then they're slowly roasted uh, until they're soft. And um, we freeze them so we can slice them really thin like lox. And uh, when they come out, just season with salt, pepper, a little olive oil for that oily sheen that 
we would see on smoked salmon. And we serve that with um, uh, cream cheese that's, uh, I don't know if you guys remember yesterday, I have a company called Kite Hill, and we make cream cheese out of cultured almond milk. And uh, this cream cheese is now available anywhere, Target, Whole Foods, but it started out as a dish uh, at the restaurant. Okay, um, another great product we get in from the Pacific Northwest are lobster mushrooms. We get them once a year in August for about a month and a half, and we do all sorts of fun stuff for them. I'll show you in a minute. Um, this is a component for the next dish. It's a ceviche um, for our seafood tower. And this tower is... Um, we run it uh, between August and September when the lobster mushrooms are there. On top, it's all cold preparation, or hot preparation, so the lobster, lobster mushrooms, the calamari we make out of hearts of palm that's grown for us in Costa Rica, and it's sustainably grown with three shoots, so once they harvest one, they give it a chance to grow instead of slashing and burning, which happens in a lot of other uh, hearts of palm farms. Uh, we have a take on our Oyster Rockefeller um, and a Clam Casino, and on the bottom you'll see the locks again, a Crab Louis salad, and little shooters. You get a choice of vodka or tequila shooters and um, oyster mushrooms in the bottom. And that's it. So I'm going to show you a, a bouillabaisse that we do, and uh, then we'll move on to the artichoke oyster. So. And if anyone has any questions along the way, feel free to ask because they keep me occupied. <laughs> I've got one. Yeah. <laughs> do you ever run into haters who talk about, who complain about the names of things? We, we do in uh, stuff we write at the Post all the time. Who would say, you can't call it locks. Yeah. You can't call it, can't call it this, can't call it that. And I'm, I'm like torn. You'll hear me say you can't call cauliflower steak. It's just not uh -huh. steak, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> but when you get to like oyster mushrooms, I didn't name them oyster mushrooms. They're right. called oyster <laughs> mushrooms because they have a similar texture to an oyster. And so we're very um, picky when we, we make those assumptions and we name those dishes. Yeah. Great question. Okay, so we've got uh, leeks, fennel to start the bouillabaisse. And some herbs de Provence, some saffron. What else you got, Joe? <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious, you know, I talked about Middle Eastern food, um, earlier today. Why, why do you think that, that Mediterranean, cause you focus a little bit more on the Mediterranean, but you're we do, from Israel. We do, yeah. Why, why do you think that those cuisines are so well suited to plant-based cooking? Um, you know, I think in that region, people are down with eating vegetables. Mm. It's not you know, an afterthought, it's not foreign. Um, and I, I think that's the case in almost any country except for the U.S., you uh -huh. know, where, you know, meat is often an accent on the plate or used as seasoning or people eat once or twice a week. Um, but, yeah, I think in, in the Mediterranean, it's got such a great climate, very similar to California, mm -hmm. and... You can't deny the awesome produce and, and the fruits and vegetables that come from there. Yeah. So we're going to add a little garlic, and we have some artichoke hearts. And I wouldn't normally let this go a little longer, um, but we're going to add some color to our oyster mushrooms. And lobster mushrooms. You serve you serve a bou the bouillabaisse at the restaurant. We do, yeah. Can I ask what you charge for it? 
Uh, all our soups are, I think, around 12, 13 bucks. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because the, the lobster mushrooms, they, they can fetch. Yeah, they're $26 really a pound. Right. So they're more expensive than right. Some lobster. <laughs> right, right. More expensive than yeah. lobster. I didn't hear that. The question was, what are your thoughts about the different kinds of saffron, the different sources of saffron? Yeah, I really I don't know too much about that, so sorry. I mean, I know it's harvested by hand, so I think that's what usually drives the price up. So maybe the big bag, someone wasn't paid enough to pick it. I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah, it could be how much they were paid to pick it. That's actually... Yeah, I don't know. Uh, we've got some diced tomatoes going in. And then what really adds um, a flavor of the ocean to this is the stock. And this is made uh, with kombu seaweed, a little bit of sugar, and um, sencha tea, which oh. is a um, wow. really awesome uh, sweetness, kind of um, earthy flavor. So. Uh, the stock, obviously, we didn't have a chance to make ahead of time, or we did make ahead of time, but um, we would add that. Uh, kombu, seaweed. Yeah. yeah. Are you working a lot with seaweed? Yeah, yeah. so we use seaweed um, in a lot of different dishes, but usually not in a traditional way that people eat seaweed, so right. I think in the U.S. we're used to eating it in sushi and, you know, it's mostly nori, but, right. you know, we, we bring kombu, wakame, all sorts of seaweeds, and um, now I'm trying to har or source them from the East Coast. Uh -huh. Very worried about the, you know, the fact that Fukushima has been leaking for how many years now? And it was five times what Chernobyl was. So I would prefer not to get seaweed from the Pacific. Right. Um, cool. So this would go normally go a lot longer. Um, I'll just plate one up, and then I'll show you the artichoke oysters, which are a signature at the restaurant. Uh, no more than 40 minutes. Yeah, it doesn't need to go too long. Yeah, I feel like artichokes, I see artichokes a lot in um, vegan dishes that are meant to evoke the sea. Yeah. Yeah, why is that? The texture, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's our uh, vegan bouillon base. We have uh, Christini and Rui, and uh, I'll show you the next dish, which Beautiful. is the artichoke oyster. Beautiful. Thank you. Chef, have you, have you noticed a change in, the, uh, in your customers in terms of who they are and what they're interested in since you've been open? Um, we, you know, we never catered to the vegan crowd. Mm -hmm. um, we were the first fine dining restaurant in LA that was completely plant-based for us to have a you know, full bar. And a lot of the vegans in town you know, go to the more casual cafes and restaurants. Most of our guests, I'd say 90% aren't even vegetarians. Mm. So, yeah. And that's been consistent? From, yeah. 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 OK. So this dish has been around since we opened, actually a little bit longer. Um, I was peeling an artichoke one day, and the petals fell on a plate, and they kind of reminded me of an oyster shell or a clam shell. And that's kind of how I work. I start reversing uh, the process of foods that I used to eat or people miss eating and people request. Um, so this was a great vessel. Uh, for the dish, and then I had to think about how is, how is I going to create the rest of it. So I wanted to use the whole artichoke, so we 
puree the hearts. And those go down to anchor the uh, oyster mushrooms that are going to go in next. In the puree, a little bit of cashew cream mm. and some seasonings. I think you guys have the recipe, hopefully. The oyster mushrooms, um, before we coat them in cornmeal and fry them, we uh, season them with also the granulated nori that I was telling you about for mm. the locks, and um, then cornmeal. Those get fried. And this is, it looks like a lot, but this is a really quick pickup. And I would say we sell 50 to 60 of these a night. They probably go out to almost every table. Um, next is a Bernays sauce that we make out of uh, yellow tomatoes that are poached and taken down uh, with tarragon and vinegar. This one's not as yellow. The tomatoes this time of year are not great. Even in California, huh? That makes me feel better. <laughs> Chef, do you, do you see people's uh, misconceptions about vegan food changing? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I've been cooking this way for 20 years, and guys that I went to school with and are now coming around and hitting me up. I used, used to be the weirdo. Uh -huh. Nobody <laughs> thought when I got out of school that I would do much. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> some of those people are still, you know, I'm in touch with and they've been running restaurants as long as I have. And they hit me up all the time for um, recipes. And it's just, it's exciting to see, you know, non-vegans cook this way to me that's that's a really good sign yeah yeah you've got the secrets now that they need yeah yeah and i'm always happy to share them the caviar is made from kelp how do you make it we don't it's made oh, okay. in, in the netherlands you buy it yeah. you buy it yeah and that's it this is our artichoke oyster and you just pop it like you would an oyster and uh, that's it. That's great. Uh, these just $14 for the plate. Yeah. So, said, I'm sorry, you said it's 14 Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's beautiful. Yep. Yeah. We do, and also the, the second cookbook has a pantry list and lists, you know, the mother sauces that we make that we utilize for multiple dishes. Um, the kitchen is run like a traditional French kitchen. You know, the, the sauces, the stocks, everything's made and used uh, throughout, you know, different services. The uh, Bernays sauce we also use for brunch and... Um, so it would be very familiar to a lot of you guys. Nope. <laughs> I, but I, I never tell anybody what they should eat. You just serve them what you want, yeah. and they love it yep. because it's great. Exactly. <laughs> Any other questions for Chef? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. So now we have uh, the pleasure of welcoming back um, Sherelle Berger from Tel Aviv. Um, how many here have traveled to Israel? I wish that I could raise my hand with you. It's at the top of my list, although now, after coming to a conference like this, I don't know about you, but then all these other places start popping up to the top of the list too, like Istanbul. Um, so I haven't had the pleasure of eating at OPA yet. Um, but I've certainly read all about it, and I thought her dishes that she made earlier looked 
um, incredible. Our brassica on brassica stuff. Um, so I can't wait to see what Sherelle has to show us too. Jeff? <laughs> Where are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay, so um, today I'm going to make um, three dishes out of fruit. Um, like we do at OPA, we take one vegetable or one fruit and we make it the centerpiece. And I, I really have used a lot of uh, fruit as a company to, you know, savory dishes. But I thought it would be very, very fascinating to uh, create a savory dish out of uh, fruit. And um, that's what we're going to do. So I'll start with the plum. Um, the plum is um, one of the dishes that was born out of just going to a market and finding what umabushi was and what plum wine was and then saying, oh, plums are fascinating, really. And um, so I'll explain what we have here. Um, so first of all, this is, uh, for whoever doesn't know what umabushi is, it's a uma plum, um, Japanese, their first third dried and then they're salted. Um, we don't have those in Israel, so I did my own version. Um, so these have been fermenting for almost a year now. Um, they don't look really good because I had to bring them from Israel in a, a vacuum bag. Um, so these are salted and 7% uh, solution. Um, then we have the puree here. Um, so it's almond puree with the um, salted plum and um, plum wine barigo, which has uh, fermented mushrooms, which I really like to use. As I was saying previously, we don't throw anything away. So we have a mushroom dish and all the ends that we don't use, we ferment in salt and we use them as a very umami uh, flavor adjective. Um, then we have the uh, white onion puree. Um, garlic oil, so it's just olive oil with thinly sliced uh, garlic. And then we have the uh, black mustard compote. So um, we generally uh, use uh, bigger plums in Israel. We slice them on the mandolin, and then every day when we're, we don't sell out of them, so we try to make a vinegar. So this is from last year's vinegar. Um, so plum vinegar, black mustard, um, ginger that we also um, pickle ourselves, and some shallots. And these plums, I have to tell you guys, are probably the best plums I had in my whole life. Um, I asked the chefs, and it's uh, from uh, one of the chefs' house that grows there, and they're super tart and uh, really amazing, so I wish we had them in Israel, but we don't. Um, and now I'm going to plate. Um, so, yeah. The plums are from California? Yeah, yeah, from uh, right around here. Yeah. The best plums I've ever had have also been from right around here. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Stone fruit. Yeah, I'm going to use my hand right now. So what I love about this is, you know, our culinary definitions of the difference between fruits and vegetables are already completely different from the botanical definitions of fruits versus vegetables. Um, there's plenty of things that we treat as fruits that are vegetables and vice versa. So, yeah. And, and who says that fruit has to be sweet? Who says? Right. You understand? Who says? <laughs> 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 Don't listen to anyone is my advice, okay? Um, they look almost like big olives. Yeah, they're seriously, they are just outstanding, I have to say. I, that's all I can say about them. And this is the plum puree with the almonds, Marcona okay, almonds. Okay, great, okay. You weren't listening, Joe. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's kind of a lot, Jeff. <laughs> is there anything that you do not pickle? Um, <laughs> uh, no, no. Yeah. I, I, I mean, pickling and fermentation are two different things. So uh, we do do a lot of fermentation. Pickling, actually, not that much. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> She's got my number, hasn't she? Yeah. <laughs> I said no talking when playing. Sorry. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's helping me. It's helping me. Everybody be I'm very not, quiet. I'm not like in, as embarrassed as I would be, you know. 
like naturally. So, keep on. Oh, you okay. Have more questions? Okay. Um, <laughs> let's see. So, I found it really interesting earlier when you were talking about, um, you know, not using the word vegan anywhere in the restaurant, which I know some other restaurants um, here also ab abide by that. Mm -hmm. Do do you get many? Um, vegan customers? Do they it's say that they want it? It's funny because Tal was saying something that I really, really was like, oh my God, seriously, it's the worldwide. No, vegans diss my restaurant. Ah, uh, why? Um, most of them. I don't say all of them, but most of them. Because it's uh, not like trying to be something else and not tr it's not big portions and I don't know mm. what. And actually people, and this is something really, really important to me. It's like there's a seafood and a meat restaurant. That's their expertise. The same thing with Opa or any other vegetable restaurant. It's That's what we do. We do vegetable and fruit and seeds and nuts. That's what we do. Like, don't talk to me about other things. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. It's like I can't. I I can hear it, but I just like don't even relate to it anymore because it's like hmm, not relevant, you know. Yeah, exactly. So, but I wish I had these plans. So, whoever's coming from California to Israel, please give me <laughs> shit. <laughs> No. 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 These I are... asked what the variety is. I don't know. It's baby plums. Like I, I really don't know. They grow at the chef's house, and I, I'm in love with them. That's all I know. They're really perfect. Any experts in plum varieties want to take a guess? California plum varieties. I don't know why I'm thinking. I, I really don't know a lot about California plum, plum varieties, but I keep thinking Santa Rosa. Oh. Those are big. Okay. See, I told you I didn't know anything about. Them. So this is the plum. Okay. Um, so this is the. I, I didn't say enough about it, but really, um, this is one of the dishes that I created and I love that the first time. And I'm not like the kind of people that can eat their own food. It really, I can have one bite and I'm like, okay, fine, let's move on. <laughs> and uh, and I was like, wow, this is. Wow. And and then uh, we had it on our opening. Our restaurant is super young. It's seven months old. And we had it on the opening uh, menu. And everyone was going crazy. And I was, like, pushing it, like, any plum I could get. And it was like, <laughs> Israel is very, very seasonal. So if it's not plum season, it, there's no plums to get. So I'm, like, pushing it. And I'm like, oh, my God. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Blah, blah, blah. And then I see someone on the street that I know. And she's like, why don't you do anything with pears? I'm like, oh, Good idea. <laughs> because really, before the restaurant was open, my mom's friend gave me like um, two pounds of pears, and I was like, um, where should I put this? Oh. I was like, uh, what do I do with this? So they were kind of like becoming overripe, and uh, I was like, okay, I'll juice them, and I'll, make a, I'll try to make a vinegar, and the vinegar was really, really good. So I remembered that, and then I was like, okay, let's start. So now we'll talk about the pear dish. Um, so really, this one is uh, more what I'm talking about. We don't use any uh, almonds or any uh, kind of nuts on this dish, which I really, really like because it is uh, one step forward. It is focusing a lot on the uh, pear itself and not trying to, you know. So I was just fascinated, fascinated with the, the kind of uh, flavors that we can extract out of one pear, really. Mm. So... Um, we have a green garlic season in Israel, and uh, it's kind of like ramps, I guess, here where everyone goes crazy, and it's like on every menu, so it's the same thing. We add green garlic, but I was like, oh, I'm going to California, now I can ask for ramps. So this is a ramp puree. Um, so it's the, we take the white parts of green garlic or ramps, and we uh, saute them until translucent. And then we make a puree in the same, we just uh, blanch the greens and make a puree as well. Uh, this is uh, vinegar that we make at Opa. I have a real slight obsession with uh, vinegar making. Um, it's, it's really, really fascinating to me. So um, we make a pear vinegar, and this is um, reduced pear vinegar. Um, it's tarragon oil, and these are uh, caramelized uh, pears that are actually re re just uh, dehydrated in the oven for three hours. 
Um, and this is raw pear and uh, chervil. So we'll start. I think I got it all that time. Oh, you wrote everything down? Yep. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself uh, again. Honey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I will embarrass myself in some way, but. So your green garlic um, that you get in Israel, do you use when you when you're typically getting it? Has it formed the bulb, like a big no, bulb? No, it's super young. It... It's like it's 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 really really young. There's no bulb. Only okay. in the end of the season it yeah. starts forming the bulb, and then you can't use the green parts because they're too they're like too tough. yeah. So it's like when they're super super young. color right yeah love it they really look like caramelized onions don't they <gasps> this is the reduced vinegar Are those pears that you like to use for this? Are they super? Are they super ripe, or are they a little no, no, un, actually, a little yeah, underripe? Yeah. No, no, unripe as possible. Okay. And then we just put them with salt and a little vitamin C to keep their color, and then that's what makes them like easy to work with. And more savory, right. since they're still a little tart. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, there's, a, there's actually like a variety that grows specially. That's why I actually started doing the pear dish in, in Israel is that I got this insane variety that grows only in Israel. Um, and, um, I, I don't know the name really, but it's just insane, insane. You can't get it anywhere in the world. It's, it's indigenous to one grower and, and that unfortunately is also very, very seasonal. Um, but basically, the pears, like bosque isn't good. I try to use bosque. It's not a good uh, variety because they need to be um, as unripe as possible. So that way, it's easier to make it a savory dish. Um, yeah. Seems like pears are um, unripe, 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 rot rotten. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it's actually easier to work with an unripe pear because you have more time. Yeah, and then when they become too ripe, we uh, make vinegar. So it's a win-win situation. Cheerful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What do you do with the cores and the stems and all the stuff that's left over when you shave the pears? So yeah, we if we we don't have like regular pears, we just uh, we put them with uh, we put them with uh, we cryo back them with uh, sugar for three days until the the bag like becomes like huge, and then we pop them, and then we do that like three or four or more times on the course of a week, and then we strain that liquid, which is like already slightly like alcoholic just a little mm. bit and then we uh let it we just pray that it's gonna be a vinegar somehow and that's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um yeah tarragon oil some salt that is so beautiful yeah yeah so that's the pear love it <laughs> thank you Okay, so now we're off to an apple, which is now uh, basically a combination of um, vegetables and uh, fruits. Um, the apple 
as you can see here, um, it has been also 1% salt for 24 hours. Then uh, we dehydrate them uh, with a, a garlic oil for wow. an insane amount of time. And then they become this. And um, this is raw celery root, fermented celery root. Fermented, not pickled. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then this is the uh, celery root puree, which is just uh, celery root, olive oil, um, and salt. Just wa water, and that's it in the end. And then we have the apples that um, we rehydrate um, in a port barigol. Usually it's white, but now it's red. And so we put also fermented mushrooms, sage, uh, chilies. I like to have a little bit of spice. Um, and uh, that's it. So this is currently on Opa's menu. Some people uh, think uh, it's great, and some people think it's too intense in <laughs> flavor. Um, but I really like it. Uh, it's one of my favorites, actually. Wait, did I miss that? What's that? Really? You were doing so well. I was, but I didn't see you. I didn't know what was inside the cream whipper. Yeah, so it's um, celery root. Just we cook it, we caramelize it just a little bit with olive oil, and then we puree it with water. Yeah, okay. And uh, so these are the apples. Um, I have, I, we really, it's not a joke. We make almost all our vinegars ourselves. Um, the one that I was uh, used with the fennel is just outstanding. It's um, aged, which I really like. Um, and if we don't have something on hand, so just regular champagne vinegar um, from France. But um, yeah, I do. I do have. That's a, a lot of times people come to the restaurants with like <laughs> vinegar allergies, and I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> you gotta go if you don't like garlic and you don't like vinegar. I, I don't know how you're gonna find yourself. <laughs> Enjoy this list of other restaurants. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's true. Like I don't try to do stuff for. That's my fights with my partners. They're like, you're not, it's not the restaurant for you. It's for other people. Think about other people. I'm like, okay. So well, clearly some other people have been coming. Yeah, no, but it's sometimes <laughs> I, I'm like, only my taste and this right. is what I want. And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, you know, I, I don't want to say I'm a ship, but like we have like craziness in our heads a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> really. That's it. That's beautiful. We have time. We do. Looks like we have a few more minutes. Okay, so you want to ask me so, questions? So now? let's talk some more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so have you have you noticed a change? Um, I know I know it's fairly the restaurant's fairly young, but have you noticed a change in what people want and what they're after when they come? To the restaurant specifically? Yeah, or in your pre, even in your, I'm curious if you've noticed a difference in customer taste when it comes to vegetables over your career, really. First of all, I, I think, and I, and I said that uh, Israel more than, I've lived in New York, I've uh, been exposed to organic, farm to table, all these things, but really vegan food is something that I was exposed most in Israel. I think, uh, I mean, 5% of the population in Tel Aviv where our restaurant is, is vegan, even though they don't really come to the restaurant, but um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but really it's, uh, it is something that is more popular. And uh, like uh, Tal was saying that chefs are asking him for advice on vegetables and stuff. I feel like that's what happens to me. They're just like calling me and asking me what to do with vegetables and stuff like that because it's not a secret what's going in the industry. You know, it's pretty horrible. So we have to do something about it and be more aware. Right. 
Yeah. Um, do you think people have misconceptions about your food? Yeah, all the time. What do they think and what are, and They're, how are they wrong? First of all, a lot of the time very cynical. Uh, like, oh, because everything is very small and it's like a tasting menu and in Israel everything's like, yalla, la, <laughs> this, that. And I'm like, oh, no, this is... So it's like uh, Israelis are cynical, but I think that what I say all the time about food in general and maybe also about Opa is that um, it, it, the flavors speak so much louder than words that I, I don't don't try to fight it. I just, I'm like, okay, fine. Just come and taste the food. And, and a lot of times if people don't enjoy the food, if it's like too odd for them, the flavor, the whatever. So we're like, we don't, we, we compensate them and we do anything just to make them feel good with themselves. But really it's, it's, it's new. It's new to a mm -hmm. lot of people, the, the concept. How do your prices compare to but we're Whatever. talking shekels, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Look, look, okay, so I can say for Israel, it's like a lot of the times, uh, to me, this is what a lot of people don't understand. Um, the most work on any restaurant is the garment J station. Mm -hmm. So imagine a whole kitchen that's based on garment J. Right, right. So, <laughs> like, you have to understand how much work, how much hand have been through everything you're eating. And that's why we have, like, I think we're very fair and must, people that under, are from the industry think we're cheap, but we just do it because we're new and we want to be also available for local people and not only tourists. So, you know, it's, it's that way. But uh, I honestly think that people that comprehend food understand the, the work of, of this kind of uh, cuisine. How much do you, what do you say to people on the menu? How much do you tell them about all the work that goes into the dishes? I'm just thinking about, you know, I was having a hard time keeping up with all the elements, obviously. Um, but do you tell them this was like the kohlrabi, this was um, fermented, dehydrated, rehydrated? Yeah, you know, no, like or, we say like three words. Like we, when yeah. I was, when I was like in charge, I told them the whole thing and then they're like, no, 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 <laughs> no one can understand all this. Just say like three words so we and then obviously if people ask more and stuff so we tell them but it's like yeah. very minimal and also the the menu which i like is very minimal like it's not like all the techniques and all that just like apple three other components that's it so it's very minimal great yeah yeah i love it so <laughs> so what uh what are some of the most frequent questions that you get from customers <laughs> um Will you marry me? <gasps> Just kidding. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm actually married already, Cheryl. <laughs> I was talking about what questions you get. <laughs> um, what are the questions? Um, wow. I don't know. Like Mostly about the food. Mostly mm. of how I come up with the ideas, I think. Because... Not to say anything, I, I read a lot. It's so important to me for, to read because I teach myself a lot. But most of the stuff is, is like really, I use techniques that I know, but the putting everything together is something that is born in my head. Really, honestly, I yeah. don't like, no, I don't like, no. So. Can you, I'm act, now I'm actually curious. Um, do you have a story of, a, of how you came up with a dish that might show us a little bit about how your mind works? Like, yeah, I think that I was saying about the plum, and, and uh, honestly, that's what happened to me. That I, and I think that when you're cooking only with vegetables and fruits, you're always looking for new ingredients. And uh, I was in a health food store, and I see, like, this small, very expensive umabushi, and I'm like, oh, my God, I have to try this. I try it. Oh, my gosh, it's so salty. What is this? Mm. Then I go to another, oh, plum wine, all these things. And then I'm like, wait, plums are amazing. So then I understand this is the type of cuisine I want to create. I want to take one vegetable or fruit and really, really focus on it with different techniques. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> are, there, are there other chefs that inspire you? Of course. Yeah. Can you tell us about Noma that? Noma is like, oh, I'm Noma, now yes. currently obsessed. This is fermentation. We're joking around, but really I, am, I brought the book with me. I am so obsessed with this book. His fermentation book is, um, it's really like the, the, I mean, it's funny because they've been, everything we've been eating has been fermented generations over generations, but it's really, I think, uh, when you're cooking with vegetables and fruits, that's the, you're looking for umami, you're looking for those deep, deep flavors, and that's the best way to, to create them. Right. Really? Um, 
Oh, it's it's too it's too small. I was telling my um my uh, co-workers, oh, I have two chefs helping me uh, pr prepare for this. I'm so spoiled now. Like in Israel, it's it's very small. It's very very expensive, and you can't take too much money for what you're you know what you're preparing. So uh, basically, my partners are my. Uh, prep cooks, my mom comes and helps me. <laughs> Everyone, I'm like, okay, come and help me, come and help me, come and help me, really. Um, so it's, it's, it's really that way. Um, it's, it's, it, I have to say that in Israel, the, the restaurant industry is, is um, not as up to beat as it is in the rest of the world. Although there's great food, but not like the restaurant understanding of how a restaurant works. The question I don't understand. What's the how much do how much do cooks get paid? <laughs> okay, first of all, this is what I do to cooks to understand if they're serious or not. Minimum wage, seriously, because it's it's not a little bit above a minimum wage. Okay, I can't say I can say in shekels, but it's not going to mean anything like whatever. Uh, I pay them just above minimum wage, obviously by law, just because I think that. There is something, and I've been speaking to my friends, like in the industry in New York, I started seven and a half dollars, now it's like 14 or 15 to start or something crazy like that. So it's really, to me, to understand how committed the people are to working, to really learning, because I'm learning and they're learning with me. So it's like something that is more than, you know, paying someone. So I really have on, on that, like a really good staff that is, willing to learn more than anything. Yeah. Questions? More questions from the audience? <laughs> what? How many, how many? Um, our restaurant is uh, pretty small, it's 35, it's 30 seats. Um, so now it's like 40 to 50 people a night. On good nights it's 50, on average like 40-ish. Yeah. So. And so, how many? So, how many? Um, do you do you think about the idea of covers, which is like? Yeah, yeah obviously, many, obviously. Yeah, yeah. No. Well, first of all, the. No. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. Seriously. I just don't know. If, <laughs> no, you. <laughs> you have to understand when a, a <laughs> restaurant opens in Israel, everyone is freaking out for three months. No one can talk about anything else. Your phone is ringing nonstop. Mm -hmm. When the critics get your, a good review, it's crazy, 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 crazy. And then I'm like. You go down like after three or four months, and thankfully that really hasn't happened at Opa because I think that a lot of people haven't been exposed because it's a small restaurant. Um, but yeah, there is kind of like a down after the beginning. We're only open seven months, so it's like now it's I think starting to stable itself because a lot of people that are didn't understand the type of cuisine were coming in, and now it's like more people that really want to come and experience something. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. It's a good question. <laughs> um, I I don't know. I came back to Israel uh, five years ago when I thought I was going to live with my parents and discover food around the world, and then things happen, and it it really I think because the produce is so unique and just amazing, it, it's it's so right to open in Israel. Um, we'll see about the future. <laughs> um, we also can ask questions of Tal, too, um, who's still here. But yes, what did you, did you have a question? Where is he? Oh, hi. Hi, there you are. Um, you had a question? Favorite uh, authors and books? First of all, Harold McGee. Uh, is uh, really, I mean, he's classic, but he's like, it's on cooking, on food and cooking, and it's, it's like every time I want to know, like, because I think that when you work with vegetables and, and fruits is something that uh, is not known, like the structure to know the families of the vegetables and stuff like that, so that for the base is something that I go to here and there. Um, I said the Noma fermentation book I'm, I really like, um, and... Uh, I just I have a lot of cook, I have a lot of them and I, I just like go to them like here and there I I am always like going back and forth so yeah Tal what do you read what are you reading who are you reading 
Sir. I'll explain. Uh, first of all, most of the restaurants in Israel are very the same, and the like the flavor profile. It's it's really good. I love Israeli cuisine. I think the restaurants are really really good. But I, I, it's like how much of the same thing can you eat? You know? Yeah. So you want to be different? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I, I really hate making desserts. I have to be honest, but I, I, I have to warm up to the uh, deal. So we have really. <laughs> no, I, I, I really, before the restaurant was opening, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do about desserts? What am I going to be about? Like, because uh, I think the most challenging thing is to have really good desserts in a vegan menu. Um, so we have two desserts right now that I, I really like. Um, one is lemon and, and strawberries. So we have a lemon sorbet with mm. fermented macadamia <laughs> milk and um, white balsamic vinegar with vanilla. Um, and then we have um, another um, sorbet slash ice cream uh, based on cashews um, and local dates and um, coffee on uh, Jandoya, which is a Italian kind of uh, chocolate with uh, orange. Yeah. So there's definitely Israeli touches um, here and there, and you're working with Israeli products. Yeah, and, and obviously, of yeah. course. I'm not, I like it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sounds like it a lot. Other questions? No. Really not. I think, and also, like, every time that I, I, it, I gets to me that we're not, like, packed, fully packed, I'm like, it's okay. It's new. It's new. It takes time. It takes time. It takes time. And, and I really, truly believe that, especially in the restaurant industries, that when you're doing something new, it takes time for people to really, like, get to you and understand what you're doing. And then, yeah. Some of what you're doing um, reminds me of Bar Tartine in uh, San Francisco. Did you ever go there? No, but I heard. Yeah, the uh, fermentation, fermenting, <laughs> not just pickling. Um, uh, it reminds me quite a bit. And dirt candy a little bit. Um, Amanda Cohen's restaurant in New York. Are you mm -hmm. familiar with that? Yeah. 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 Some of the doubling and tripling and quadrupling up of the uh, one ingredient flavors. Yeah, I, I love, love it. it. Yeah. I love it. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> so typical. <laughs> One of those, yeah. <laughs> You have the check. You cut the check already. <laughs> no, yeah. Is the check cleared yet? I mean, I... <laughs> yeah. No, it's that's true. Great. I really didn't arrange a payment before. So. <laughs> Venmo. Venmo is much easier. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. 
Oh, well, we work with a really great bakery. They also use uh, the old technique of making bread, which they don't use any uh, cultivated um, uh, yeast, but they just let it wildly ferment yeah. for 32 hours. And it's, it's just uh, sensational bread. So uh, we, we do, whenever someone takes the tasting menu, we just uh, let it out freely. But I've eaten the tasting menu a few times, and I think that it's, it's too filling with too much bread. I, when we opened, I didn't want to have bread on the menu, but obviously it got vetoed. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so. I'm glad to hear that you, you've eaten the entire um, tasting menu. That you I do. have to sometimes to see, like, what it's like. I sometimes get the sense, I don't know if anybody in the audience does or you know where I'm going with this, but I sometimes definitely get the sense that chefs don't no, I, eat I, their I, whole tasting menu. I don't, but like every or, few months I, yeah, I, we yeah. sit down and we eat just to understand like that the quality is all right, the service, stuff like that. And the uh, pacing. Yeah. And the interaction. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've had some really bad uh, dinners there. Just yep. <laughs> yep. Anything else? Thank you, Chef. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Sherelle. Thank you, Tal. Um, you now have a, a little break. And uh, I'm trying to think if the music has stopped. There has been an issue with music playing. We do not. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that I can't speak for, <laughs> but um, we were trying to locate its source. No one knows where it's coming from. If you still hear it, just know we are working on the problem, and I'm really, really sorry. Um, I think it might be gone, but we will continue fixing it during the break, and uh, if it's still here. Uh, in So you have a half-hour break now, and then you have your second session. Uh, in this particular room, we will be having the QSR Fast Casual um, pa uh, CIA ca Fast Casual Watch List. So we'll have a panel here. In the Napa Valley Vintners Theater, um, a session on bridging to your vegan customers, the new world of plant-based ingredients. And then in the Food Business School classroom on the second floor, discerning palates, curious minds, how to feed Gen Z and millennial consumers. So go have coffee, um, some snacks for the next half hour, and then at 4.30, make your way back to your room. And at 5.30, we'll have the reception and we'll test what your colleagues have been working on. Hi, I'm here to talk about senior living and healthcare, a very important segment. Using Rich's products, operators are able to offer a variety of customizable meals, higher quality food, and provide impressive selections. Snacks are also very important to seniors. So we have a breadstick that you can make out of our Rich's pizza dough. We also have a Rich's parfait made with layers of our Rich's on top, applesauce, and our crumbled uh, Uber, which we call the ultimate breakfast round or super granola round. Also, using our 6x6 Rich's flatbread, you can make a caprese sandwich, which is very, very appealing and tasty. You can also cut this into triangles for a shareable application. Then we also want to talk about the Rich's plant-based cooking cream. This is one of our newest products. It does not contain any of the eight allergens. It can make a vegan tomato soup. You start with a little bit of oil and sweat your vegetables till they're tender. Then you add a slurry, some vegetable broth, some crushed tomatoes, and thicken that up. And then you come back and finish it with the plant-based cooking cream for a creamy vegan tomato soup, which goes great with breadsticks and our sandwiches. Using Rich's products, you can cater to that dinner party generation and provide impressive selections. Hi, Chef Jake here from Rich's. I'm here to talk to you today about our new ready to stretch pizza dough. It's unique, authentic, versatile, and flexible. It gives you the opportunity to make beautiful artisan style pizzas 
by taking dough right from the refrigerator onto the screen, stretch it to the thickness you want, and then top it and bake it in whatever oven you have. We have six inch or 12 inch dough. You may buy pizza dough already from Rich's and you say, well, what makes this different? What makes it different is it's ready to stretch right from the fridge. It's authentic, it's unique, and it's ready to stretch to give you that artisan pizza dough that you've been looking for for your operation for years. So let's stretch a pizza. We'll use our, our six inch, six ounce, ready to stretch pizza dough we took right from the refrigerator. This eliminates proofing, so it makes it easier for the operator to use. I'll stretch our dough without even picking it up. And you can make this as thick or thin as you want. I'll, stre I'll stretch this six inch dough to about 12 inches. And even if it's not perfectly round, it gives it that rustic artisan look. So today we're gonna prepare a margarita pizza. I'll take our ready to stretch pizza dough, use a, a small amount of pizza sauce, spread it evenly, and then add our ingredients. I have sliced tomato, fresh mozzarella cheese, and we'll get this right in the oven and bake this. We're gonna bake this at a high temperature and we'll see how nice it comes out of, out of the oven. Whether you have a, an impinger oven, whether you have a convection oven, or a wood stone oven, the pizza bakes up perfectly every time. So let's get to the oven. So here's our pizza straight out of the oven. We'll add our basil. And we'll cut it up for our customers to enjoy. We have to remember with this pizza crust, the texture is that of real scratch dough without making it from scratch. And I think your guests are gonna love it. So there we have it, an artisan pizza made with our Rich's ready to stretch pizza dough. Remember, no proofing, and we get that airy artisan texture with a nice crunchy crust. And I think you're gonna love it. So I invite you to take our new ready to stretch pizza dough, serve it to your customers, and see what great reaction you have. Hey, thanks for joining me in my kitchen today. I hope to see you again real soon. Hi, I'm here to talk to you about a very competitive segment, college and universities. College students are clamoring for plant-based products, and Rich's has a new broccoli and cheese pizza crust and a cauliflower crust. Lots of options you can do with these plant-based crusts. You can, of course, do a pizza, but it makes a great panini, a gluten-free panini. You can also use it as a salad bowl for salads. You can also use it as a gluten-free crust for quiche. You can also do crackers, breadsticks, and gluten-free croutons for salads. The product comes in frozen. It is fully baked. All you need to do is thaw it under refrigeration and see how pliable it is. So you can actually fold it and make paninis out of it. It has a wonderful flavor. In fact, it's college student approved. Here is a dish with spiralized sweet potatoes, clams, and a creamy Asian turmeric sauce. Using a spiralizer, spiralize the sweet potatoes into long, thick noodles. Cook the sweet potatoes in boiling water, stirring gently for about a minute or two. Drain and set aside. Heat the vegetable oil in a wok over medium-low heat. Add the sweet potato noodles. Stir frequently and cook just until tender. Remove from the wok and set aside. In the same wok, add a little oil, add the cleanse, turn the heat to medium, add the garlic, ginger, and chopped chili pepper. Add coconut milk and no professional liquid concentrate base. Add turmeric and fresh lime juice. Cook until the clams are open, remove, and then set aside. 
reduce the broth until it's thick enough to coat a spoon and season to taste. Add the noodles back into the sauce, toss gently, and then add the clams to combine well. Place the noodles and the clams on a plate, sprinkle with furikake, cilantro, and sprouts. Garnish with lime. So here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a recipe for beet tartare with a quick cured egg, a modern take on an old classic. Combine the fish sauce, Worcestershire sauce, oyster sauce, honey, hot sauce, garlic cloves, and ground mustard. Gently place the yolks in the marinade. Cover and marinate in the refrigerator for 12 to 24 hours. These beets have been roasted, peeled, and diced. Combine the beets with the mayonnaise, Tabasco sauce, cornichons, capers, and scallions, and toss gently to combine. Season to taste and hold refrigerated. Add a small amount of oil to a cast iron pan. Cut the peeled shallots in half and sear flat side down until they begin to caramelize. Set aside. To plate, use a round cutter to form the beet tartare. Place an egg yolk in the middle. Garnish with brulee shallots, radishes, asparagus spears, dill tops, and microgreens. Finish with dots of Hellman's Real Mayonnaise. Here's our beet tartare with quick cured egg. Enjoy. This is a great dish of pressure caramelized carrots with za'atar mayo, candied sunflower seeds, and roasted parsley and carrot top gremoulade. Combine the peeled trimmed carrots with the butter, the baking soda, and a little bit of salt in a pressure cooker. Set the pressure cooker on high pressure for 15 minutes. In the meantime, prepare the gremoulade. Fry the carrot top and parsley leaves in canola oil until translucent and crisp, about 15 seconds. Drain on paper towel and sprinkle with salt. Gently toss the fried leaves with lemon zest and set aside. To prepare the za'atar mayo, combine the mayonnaise with za'atar and freshly squeezed lemon juice. Place in a squeeze bottle and refrigerate until ready to use. To prepare the candied sunflower seeds, heat the seeds in a small nonstick pan for about three minutes. Stir in the brown sugar, stirring constantly over medium heat until seeds are coated and the brown sugar has melted. Place on wax paper, sprinkle with salt, and let cool. To serve, place the warm carrots on a plate, drizzle with a za'atar mayo, top with candied seeds and gremolata. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy. This is a light, refreshing dish featuring sustainable seafood. Alaskan black cod with a grapefruit relish and an avocado cream. In a bowl, whisk together the grapefruit juice, soy sauce, mirin, miso paste, and black pepper. Marinate the cod fillets for up to 30 minutes. For the relish, char the jalapeno over an open flame. Once cooled, seed and mince. Combine with the diced grapefruit segments, scallions, sugar, red wine vinegar, and olive oil. Season to taste and refrigerate until ready to use. To make the avocado cream, combine the avocado, garlic, yogurt, Hellman's light mayonnaise, chili, and lime juice in a blender. Blend until smooth. Heat oil in a nonstick saute pan over medium heat. Pan sear the cod until opaque and beginning to caramelize. To serve, place the avocado cream on the bottom of the plate. Top with the fish and the grapefruit relish. Garnish with microgreens. Here's our finished dish. I hope you enjoy. This dish is a fun take on a classic gratiné, hollandaise crusted cauliflower 
seasoned with cheese and mustards. Cut the cauliflower into florets, then toss the florets in a mixing bowl with oil, hot sauce, thyme, garlic, salt and pepper. Place on a sheet pan lined with parchment paper and roast at a 425 degree oven until the florets begin to turn golden brown, about 15 to 20 minutes. Remove and set aside. Meanwhile, combine the panko, parsley, lemon zest, and cheeses, then season with the salt and pepper. Combine the Nor liquid hollandaise sauce with the grainy and Dijon mustards. Place the roasted cauliflower in a preheated cast iron pan, top with the hollandaise sauce, and sprinkle with the breadcrumb mixture. Roast for another 10 minutes or until the breadcrumbs are golden brown. Here is the finished dish. Enjoy!